Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our professor this evening, Eric Janislawski, is assistant professor of theology at Christendom College, where he teaches courses in sacred scripture, revelation, and Christology. He will defend his doctoral thesis concerning biblical interpretation at the Catholic University of America this fall. Professor Janislawski has earned degrees in philosophy and theology at Yale College and Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. He resides with his wife and three children in Front Royal, Virginia, otherwise known as Paradise. And we're delighted to welcome him back to the Institute of Catholic Culture this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon, for having me back. It's wonderful to be here. The crowd has gotten substantially larger, which is a good thing. And uh, I do have to echo his remarks that the format and the curriculum that they've designed for you is truly incredibly rich. It is a, it is a blessing to have that kind of thing provided through parish education. I, I can't say that I've seen it anywhere else. And so um, I do want to echo those remarks. And I also want to encourage people to go and check out the wonderful new church. I used to live by Dunloring. Uh, metro stop up there on Gallows Road, and I got to experience uh, what the present Pope has called previously, and JP2 also breathing with both lungs of the church, and it was a rich introduction to Byzantine liturgy, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. It's a wonderful uh, way to experience the richness of Catholicism if you haven't had a chance to do that already. So my talk tonight is going to be on something which will be, uh, I think, hopefully new to you in many ways and filled with information, but hopefully not too much information that it becomes overwhelming, uh, which is how we came to have the Bible as we possess it today. There are a lot of stages in that journey, but I think while some of it is scholarly information, and I tried to give you that wealth of handouts to compress some of that and to uh, give you the factual information that will undergird this talk, there are also important things to take away from how we got the Bible uh, whether it's how to approach people who have a different Old Testament than we do, such as the Protestants, uh, how to make sense of things that sometimes are trotted forward in the media, uh, like these sensational lost portraits of Jesus from the early church, from documents that we call today the Apocrypha, uh, from how to understand the role of magisterium in shaping the sacred scriptures. There's a lot of important apologetical points and devotional points in this talk, but it will also be, hopefully, a sound history of how we came to acquire the scripture in its modern versions in a way that perhaps you've uh, not heard in such detail before. So there are four of them, and just to walk you through what I've got there, the, the, top, uh, the top one that I've got here is forming sacred scripture, understanding how the Bible came to be. That's a little overview of the talk tonight, and so that will keep you on uh, the main points of the talk this evening. And then I break out some of the uh, more factual discussions about how the canon formed both Old and New Testament in their own handouts. So uh, the top one, the overview for the whole talk, is how the Bible came to be. And uh, at the very top there, I make an observation that hopefully is very well known to all of you, that the Bible is one of the most studied documents in human history. Not only is it the uh, most widely published book, uh, but we have more study on the history of this text and how this text came together and how reliable this text is uh, than any other book. I mean, we, I don't want to get into statistics upon statistics, but if you look at any other book of comparable antiquity, such as like Homer's Iliad or the Aeneid of Virgil, uh, we have many, many times more manuscript witnesses and of tremendous antiquity for the Bible. We can give a whole breakout section on the reliability of the Bible and the accuracy of the Bible. That would be its own half-hour talk tonight. But I don't want to do that. I want to give you a large-scale overview of how the Scripture came together and how we get to things such as the uh, Douay Bible or the RSV Bible or the NAB Bible or the Jerusalem Bible uh, that you read and are devoted to on a daily basis. Love for the inspired Word of God has always led people 
to love not only what the text says, but how the text came together into its present form. Uh, there's a remarkable history of its formation, and I think uh, that will be broken down into three points tonight that would be uh, sufficient to give us a sense of how the text came to its present form. First big point you can see on the bullet point list, I want to speak about how the various books of the Bible came together into one collection. We're going to call that the canon of Scripture for reasons I'll explain if you're not familiar with this term. So how we got our 46 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament into one established collection that today we call simply the Bible. Second point for our discussion this evening is how scholars have worked to obtain the best text possible for every single book in the Bible. So that brings us down to the level of the manuscripts that go into sacred scripture. And then lastly, how the Bible was translated into the various present-day English translations that you and I enjoy. So three basic steps there, and it will start with the books, and then it will get down to the manuscripts, and then once we understand that, we'll get into the present-day translations. Does that make sense? Okay, good. First things first, then. Uh, I, I gave a couple of bullet points for you to take away. If you, want the, if you want the sassy introduction to the talk and not the dry historical introduction to the talk, my thesis statement for how the canon of Scripture, how the books in the Bible came to be gathered together into the 73-book collection that we possess today goes like this. The teaching authority of the bishops of the church is the only reason why we can now claim to have the books of the Bible that we do. Or as I'd say to my students at Christendom, there's no divinely inspired book of the Bible called Table of Contents. <laughs> Would be nice, but there isn't. Uh, instead, to believe in Scripture is going to require anybody that looks into the history of this, and that's part of why it's important, to believe in Scripture is going to require that we also believe in sacred tradition and magisterium. And these three things the church has always put together as the basis for all Catholic doctrine. Scripture, tradition, magisterium. Uh, one of the beautiful things, I guess, will be coming up in uh, a talk on Dei Verbum, the uh, Second Vatican Council document, Dei Verbum 10, calls this, sometimes scholars call this the tripod of Dei Verbum. They didn't use such nerdy terminology in the council, but Dei Verbum 10 says that the scripture, tradition, and magisterium are these three bases upon which Catholic doctrine rests. First Vatican Council also said the same thing in Dei Filius, that it belongs to the church to expound the genuine meaning of sacred scripture, and then it goes into an explanation of why the church has received the books of the Bible as divinely inspired and how this came to be. And so I'd like to share some of that with you this evening. Uh, maybe to put a sharper edge on it apologetically, sometimes you come across people that believe in the doctrine of sola scriptura. And to be sola scriptura, you need a scriptura. And I think one of the interesting things that the history of the canon shows you is that you cannot have a scripture without an authority that tells you what's in the scripture. And when you look into how that came to be, you will find that it's not only the apostles who wrote it, but indeed the living magisterium of the church that was living and active well into the 4th century A.D. That was the reason why we came to have the 73 books of the scripture that we possess today. Uh, so there are some important points about how Scripture comes to us from the heart of the church and how the church has always understood this relationship between Scripture, tradition, and magisterium. And part of that comes out of the history of the canon. Does that make sense? Okay. So to talk about how we have these books together, what's a canon? Is everyone familiar with that word? It's got one end in the middle. Two end in the middle goes boom. It's on the battlefield. C-A-N-N-O-N is a field artillery piece. But when we speak of the canon of sacred scripture, C-A-N-O-N, -N, uh, that comes from a nice Greek word meaning yardstick. It's a measure, a standard, a rule. And we sometimes use this word even in English today. Sometimes people talk about canonical Western literature or canon of great books. Are you familiar with that terminology? And the idea is that this is a rule, this is a measure that gives us our complete set of proper books. So if you've read all the books of canonical Western literature, it means that you've read all the books that uh, literature professors agree is essential reading in the Western literary tradition. Does that make sense? So to this sense of canon, uh, in its ecclesiastical sense, it's a standard or a yardstick. Because if you know that God has spoken and that word has divinely inspired written form, your first question might be, well, do I have all of it? And so that list that tells you whether you have all of it, that table of contents, is what we call a canon. 
As Catholics, we profess there are 73 books in the Scripture, 46 of the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Now, these books were written over the course of many, many centuries. Indeed, took more than a millennium. And they were written in many different places by many different men in many different times. And eventually, they all came together in the thing that we presently call the Bible. Even the name of the Bible tells you that it's a collection. The English Bible comes from the Latin Biblia, and that comes from the Greek ta biblia, which is plural, which means the books, not just one book. We tend to think of it as one book nowadays, but the very word for Bible tells you it's a library, it's a collection, which thus raises the question, well, who gathered it and how, and why just these books and not other books? So let's turn to that. Uh, To address this, we have to break it into two halves, and this might be kind of obvious, the formation of the Old Testament on the one hand, and then the formation of the New. And so to start with the first, why don't we turn for a moment to the formation of the Old Testament. And there, if you want my outline for some of the next set of remarks, this important moments in the history of the Alexandrian canon is what we're going to be looking at for the next few minutes. So if you're concerned about names or dates or uh, the particular details of what I'm going to say, part of the reason why I made a few hands out is so you wouldn't have to be anxious about scribbling down all kinds of things because uh, lots of facts here, but also that allows you to free up your mind and absorb the big picture if you were concerned about capturing all the details. I tried to put a lot of those down on paper for you. In terms of the Old Testament, formed over the course of a millennium, what's the earliest book or set of books in the Old Testament? What's the earliest Old Testament literature? Where does it all begin? Job, Job, before Job? The Pentateuch, yes. Traditionally considered uh, the Pentateuch, uh, another name for it, the five books of of Moses. Yeah, and so that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and uh, the Pentateuch, as its name. Uh, the, you know, the name is kind of curious. Pentateuch means five boxes. It traveled in a little five box set. And so the name Pentateuch comes from the Greek word Pentateuchos, five boxes. Uh, But the Pentateuch were the five books of Moses, the earliest component of the Hebrew scriptures. The Jews call their scriptures Tanakh. It's a little acronym. If we had a board here, I'd put some stuff down behind me. But Tanakh is shorthand for Torah, Nebaim, Ketubim, T-N-K, which is Torah is the five books of Moses. Nebaim are the prophets and Ketubim is a Hebrew word for the sacred writings. It just means writings. And so the scripture might be broken down into these three categories. Uh, The Pentateuch, the foundation. If it comes to us substantially from Moses as author, that is very old literature. 13th century, older than almost anything else that we possess. There are some Babylonian and Syrian things that may be comparable antiquity, but this is way back before even the earliest stuff we have from like Homeric Greek. And so it's incredibly old literature, and there's always a question of when the thing was written and then when it gets assimilated into what we now call the Bible. Because, of course, everything has to be written first in order for it to be gathered into this finished collection that we call the Bible. And so a lot of things were written and then eventually gathered together into the set of writings that Jews considered divinely inspired. With the Pentateuch, it's reasonable to assume that that was fairly immediate. Uh, If you receive the core of the Pentateuch, the law of God, from the hands of Moses, who was up there on Sinai, wreathed in fire and smoke, and the mountain was trembling as God revealed to Moses the central part of the Pentateuch, reason to believe the people of Israel might have taken that into divinely inspired form and set it down as canonical right away. Uh, With other books, there's typically a time lapse between when they're written and disseminated throughout Israel and then when they are gathered into one collection and considered part of the divinely inspired sacred scripture. Uh, Just to proceed in sort of rough cut divisions, uh, the prophets, for example, the bulk of prophetical literature, and again, speaking roughly here, the scholars part of my brain is constantly setting off alarm bells because scholars hate to say anything without a footnote, and there might be some outline data. What about Daniel? But for the rough part of it, the bulk of prophetical literature is written between the 8th and the 5th centuries B.C. Now, of course, that's by many different prophets, yes? 
Uh, and so as this literature is written, it comes to be gathered together, and we have some confidence from Jewish writing that you already begin to see by around the 3rd century B.C. this standardized set of prophetical literature, three major 12 minor prophets. You're all familiar with the three major prophets that I'm referring to, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and then you have the 12 minor prophets, and those began to travel together. In fact, you see even in some of the latest books of our canonical Old Testament, like in Maccabees or in Sirach, the phrase, law and the prophets. These become sort of standard phrases in Jewish ways of speaking about their already existing sacred literature. And so this notion of the law and the prophets as an established set of writings comes to be and seems to be in place already by about the 3rd century B.C. Now, there's that third category. We've got Torah, the five books of Moses, the prophetical literature, and then you've got a whole other set of things called simply writings. It's a grab bag category, as its name might suggest. This consists of lots of different books of scripture, some historical and some sometimes called wisdom or poetical books. Now, these books are interesting because they span a whole range of times. So, for example, some of the books in the category of uh, Ketubim, of writing, are some of the oldest literature that we have outside the Pentateuch. Some gentlemen mentioned Job as a piece of wisdom literature that has some real antiquity. Scholars debate that pretty hotly as to the dating of Job. Uh, but there are certain things that are, uh, say, of more recognizable antiquity. Who wrote the core of the Psalter, of the Book of Psalms? David. When's David? This will be a little quiz on biblical history for some of you. About a thousand, yeah. So you're dealing with the 10th century B.C. Proverbs, another uh, book of the wisdom literature genre. Who wrote uh, some of the Proverbs recorded in the book of Proverbs? Solomon, David's son. And so again, we're going back to great antiquity. Uh, 10th century B.C., pretty far back. Nonetheless, some of the writings in, uh, some of the books in that category of sacred writings, or Ketubim, uh, were also some of the most recently written documents that the Jews had. And so this gets us into something that's interesting in terms of this division between the 46 books that we receive uh, as divinely inspired sacred scripture and the 39 books that Protestants and Jews uh, receive as divinely inspired sacred scripture. Because maybe something you don't know, we tend to think of the Old Testament as kind of finished off and is the books that we receive from the Jews. But I want to disabuse you of this uh, presupposition. When the Christian church came onto the scene in the middle of the first century A.D., Jews were not of a settled opinion about what was the sum total of divinely inspired books that were to be received. And so part of this disputed list of books comes from these recent writings in the category of sacred writings or Ketubim. And so some of the books in that category are very old, like I said, but some of them were the most recently written stuff that the Jews were circulating. Uh, books of the late wisdom literature, like the Wisdom of Solomon or the Wisdom of Sirach, very recently written, maybe 2nd century B.C. Some of the historical accounts in the uh, category of sacred writings. Books like 1st and 2nd Maccabees, dealing with the oppression of the Jewish people under the Seleucid Empire, which succeeded Alexander's. That was also very recently written history. And so within Judaism, at the time of Christ, there was a division of opinions about which books were to be received as divinely inspired sacred scripture contained in this category of Ketubim, or uh, sacred writings. And so this gets us to a tale of two cities. As you might expect, there are learned centers of Judaism that we're going to be focusing in on. Some of you perhaps know the terminology Alexandrian canon and Palestinian canon. Have you heard that before? No worry if you haven't, because I'll explain it to you. Okay, so in the time of Christ, when we're flashing forward to consider, now how do we get to this position where we as Catholics, and this seems funny, doesn't it? Don't we seem like the outliers in this sometimes, because we're running around with those 46 books in the Old Testament, and the Protestants and the Jews are running around with 39? You've come across this, haven't you? When you come to talk to your Protestant friend about purgatory, and you're like, I'll show you a text, ha-ha, get me my Maccabees. And then all of a sudden, you look in their Bible, and there's there no Maccabees. What happened? <laughs> Where did that come from? Uh, what this comes from is uh, 
ultimately, the discrepancy or the dispute about what was considered canonical literature coming up to the time of Christ and how the different groups involved, the Christians on the one hand and Jews on the other, eventually made their decision about what was to be considered the canonical literature of the Old Testament. So this involves a story of two regions. On the one hand, uh, Jerusalem, which as you might expect, being the capital of the Jewish nation, was a learned center of Judaism. Yes, up till its destruction at 70 AD in the Roman-Jewish War, uh, Jerusalem was the center of scholarship, and it had, of course, many people studying there, and they had many academies, and there was a whole a learned populace of Jews centered in and around Jerusalem. And then the other city in our tale of two cities is that of Alexandria. Now, maybe you don't know Alexandria as well. Uh, the city, of course, still exists today. It's in present-day Egypt near the Mediterranean. It's situated comfortably near the uh, Nile Delta, and it was a large international commercially bustling, uh, very well-known city. In fact, maybe some of you know it because it has one of the wonders of the ancient world there, yes? Which is the, the library. Yeah, there's also another one there, too. Some people say the lighthouse first. But yeah, the library is the, is the focus of our concern presently. And so the Jews in the region of Palestine, in and around Jerusalem, tended to have a more conservative opinion about what books were to be received as divinely inspired sacred scripture. Uh, they favored a shorter canon, a 39-book canon, that we nowadays call the Palestinian canon because it originated in the region around Jerusalem called Palestine. And then the Jews in and around Alexandria tended to favor a larger canon. They accepted more of those books in the category of Ketubim. Uh, they accepted the more recently written books, and they accepted uh, the wisdom literature books, and so they had a 46-book canon that was popular in and around the regions of Alexandria. Now, Alexandria was a learned city. It had an ancient Jewish population, kind of like the New York of its day. It had Greeks and Romans and Jews all circulating together in a busy trade hub. It was particularly well-situated for the flow of information, which is part of the reason why they started to build this great library there. And it was, uh, like the New York of its day, extremely populated at some periods of time with large ancient synagogues of Jews. And there would sometimes be more uh, Jews in Alexandria, some scholars speculate, than in Jerusalem from time to time. So a big, learned community of Jews there. And the Jews in Alexandria tended to speak in Greek. Yes, um, before Latin was sort of the international language, coming from the conquest of Alexander the Great, all through the regions of Greece and the Middle East and all the way over to the lapping up on the shores of India, Alexander's conquest had spread Greek, the ancient Greek language, all throughout uh, those regions. And so many people spoke Greek as an international language, and Greek was the language spoken in and around the city of Alexandria. Now, Alexandria was also a hub of philosophy, and there's lots of fascinating things that we can study about its history, but the Jews there were more open uh, to some of these uh, disputed books that the Palestinians were typically not so open to, and it settled basically down to two reasons, as best we can tell. One, uh, and that's not simply a matter of what's recently written, there were two things that seemed to be objectionable in the Palestinian mind to these disputed books between the 39-book canon and the 46-book canon. Do you know what seven books we're talking about between the two canons? Yes? So, Tobit, Judith... Baruch, what else? First and Second Maccabees, Wisdom of Solomon, and Wisdom of Sirach. Those are our disputed seven books between the Jews that centered around Palestine and the Jews that centered around Alexandria. What were some of the things that were objectionable? One, uh, some of the books, like Wisdom of Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, seemed to be influenced by concepts of Greek philosophy. If you were a more conservative Jew in Palestine, maybe that seemed like you were taking too much from the influence of the barbarian. Just to put the shoe on the other foot, the Greeks usually call everybody else barbarians. But in this case, if you're a pious Jew in Palestine, you might be concerned about the influence of Hellenism. Hellenism can be a good thing. Uh, some people look at how Athens met Jerusalem, and together with the finest of Greek philosophy and the uh, Jewish revelation meeting shortly before the time of Christ, you might have the birth of the best intellectual system the world has ever known. There's a certain privileged moment in history when Greek philosophy meets Jewish revelation right before the time of Christ. Yes? 
that propels this beautiful revelation of the New Testament forward in a way that maybe was never possible in any other age. That might be part of what's going on in the fullness of time. Uh, but the Jews in Palestine were skeptical of Hellenization, and then the Jews in Palestine also were skeptical of things that were not originally written in Hebrew. Yes. Uh, so in Palestine, you wanted to read your scriptures in Hebrew, just like all of you good Catholics still like to read your scriptures in Latin, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> and so part of the difficulty, of course, on the other side of the world is not only are the Alexandrians more open to this, but they also like to read their scriptures in Greek. And so too Jews that are in diaspora, Jews that are spread out of the Holy Land, whether they're in Alexandria or anywhere else through this Greek-speaking empire, tended to like to read their scriptures in the vernacular of the time, Greek, just like you like to read your Bibles in English more than you might like to read them in Latin, even though Latin is the mother tongue of the church. And so there emerges uh, simultaneously two things. One, a language difference, Hebrew and Greek. And two, a difference in canon. The Jews in Palestine liking their scriptures according to the 39-book canon, and in Hebrew, the Jews in Alexandria liking their scriptures according to the 46-book canon, and in Greek. Does that make sense? Okay, so we come to the formation then of a landmark event in the 3rd century, which is when uh, King Ptolemy, who was reigning in that region from 287 B.C. to 247 B.C., desired to have this great library of Alexandria. And in it, he wished to have a copy of every book in the entire world. Nice ambition. And to do this, uh, he wanted to also have a copy of the sacred writings of the Jewish people. But the Hebrew was not useful to him. And so he commissioned a group of 70 bilingual Jewish scholars to begin to translate the sacred scriptures from Hebrew into Greek. The resultant translation is known today as what? The Septuagint, from the Latin Septuaginta, from the 70 who rendered it from Hebrew into Greek. They started with the Pentateuch of Moses, and then over the next several decades, uh, they completed the work and gathered up into one edition called the Septuagint, the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon in Greek. Does that make sense? So we've got two related issues, language and canon, and then two cities, Palestine around Jerusalem and Alexandria on the other. Now that's where things sat up to the time of Christ. During the time of Christ, you would have had Jews reading scripture according to either one of the Hebrew, according to the Palestinian canon, or the Septuagint edition. And we can actually do some fun textual studies too, because you know, Jews even in Palestine were familiar with Greek. Yes, there's a fun thing if I wanted to regale you with lots of statistics. When the New Testament quotes the Old, here's a fun game you can play. When the New Testament quotes the Old, and there's a discernible difference between how the Old Testament might read in Hebrew and the Old Testament reads in Greek, it turns out that for the vast majority of books in the New Testament, the author more frequently writes in the New Testament the Old Testament citation as you'd find it in the Septuagint. Now that might be one, because you're writing in Koine Greek in the New Testament, and so uh, you're thinking in Greek, and therefore you recall the Greek text, because you're working in that language. But that also indicates that they had the Septuagint, and it was read even amongst the people like St. John, uh, who wrote the Gospel, or St. Luke, uh, who wrote the Gospel. That edition of the Septuagint was familiar even to them, even though they were in Palestine, in the Holy Land. So the Septuagint was rather widespread, and it was used by Jews both in Diaspora, in Alexandria, and in the Holy Land. And then, of course, the Hebrew text was also used in the Holy Land. So what led, then, to, one, the Jews having, nowadays, the 39-book Palestinian canon exclusively, and we as Catholics having the 46-book Alexandrian canon as part of our Old Testament? To do that, we're going to have to turn to the time of the early church. So step one is, you see that the church did not inherit from Judaism a settled matter of the Old Testament canon. We good? Diversity of usage. And in fact, the church itself did not begin to standardize uh, the canon of the Old Testament or the New until really we get into the 3rd and 4th century AD. Of course, they can't begin to standardize the New Testament canon in the first century, because it's not even been all written down yet. 
and then it hasn't even really been disseminated by the time we get into the second century. And so there are a few things uh, that begin to generate in the church a desire to get uniformity about this divinely inspired sacred scripture, which books are to be received. Part of that, and we'll go into that in the New Testament side, is the rise of heresy. Um, Part of it is a natural desire to, of course, know that one possesses the full total of divinely inspired sacred scriptures. Uh, And so when we see in the early church uh, the desire to get uniformity amongst Christians about what canon is to be received, there will be several important steps in that process. So it doesn't begin really until we get into the 3rd and 4th century AD, and when it does begin, we see these singular moments all concerning Episcopal magisterium. On the back side of the handout uh, that says important moments in the history of the Alexandrian canon, you'll see some early councils of the church. Now, I called them synods, and if you're uh, Greek-speaking, you know there's really no difference. In theology, also, technically, there's really no difference between a council and a synod. But to make the important point that these are not ecumenical councils of the church, I've called them synods on the handout. So these are what we call local councils. Nonetheless, significant teaching moments. So several important moments that begins to standardize the usage of the Alexandrian canon throughout the church. Now, already we said that even the apostles might have possessed the Septuagint, and the Septuagint was widespread throughout Jews in the region of Palestine and even the regions outside of Palestine. But when we get to the church wanting to have officially promulgated uniformity, uh, we have a few important moments. One, the Synod of Rome, 382. Uh, Pope St. Damasus I, desiring to make a statement about the canon, since the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople did not address this. We've had two ecumenical councils already, uh, but Nicaea and Constantinople did not address uh, as a matter of their uh, promulgating basic doctrines about Trinity and Christology the issue of the divinely inspired Word of God, Sacred Scriptures canon. So because the ecumenical councils didn't take it up, and there will be no ecumenical council of the earliest church that takes it up, Uh, the Synod of Rome decided to issue a statement about that. Uh, Jerome attended this uh, synod, actually, and it was where the commission to begin to translate the Vulgate was given to him. It took him a good 20 years to knock that project out, but Jerome attended this, and there were a number of people from all over the Western Church, but also some from the areas around Jerusalem that also came to attend the synod. So under Pope St. Damasus I, they promulgated a statement, and I gave it to you on the third handout, This little source text, if you're like me and you like primary texts, you want to actually have the historical document in your hands, Uh, there's a statement from Pope St. Damasus I called, On the books to be received and not to be received. De recipiendis et non recipiendis libris. And you can see in that statement of Pope St. Damasus I, expressing the mind of the Synod of Rome, uh, the affirmation of the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon as the full number of books that are to be received as divinely inspired sacred scripture. Now, a few years later, uh, in the African church, now remember, some people forget this. The African church is like three major wings of the church. Right? You have the whole Eastern church. You've got the Western church of Southern Europe. But then the African church, all the way from Alexandria, all the way over to Carthage, all along the Mediterranean coast of Africa, That was a rich, vibrant church, gave us many wonderful theologians, Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, and this was a center of Christianity, really, until it was destroyed by the waves of Muslim invasion that swept that all out of there. So for the first several centuries of the church, the African church was a large constituency of the early church. And there are four synods that took place at the end of the fourth century there that also began to expound the Alexandrian canon as the Bible of the Old Testament to be received by all Christians. Uh, One synod of Hippo in 393, and three synods in Carthage. And all of these, not surprisingly, since Alexandria is in North Africa, uh, reaffirmed what had been the constant usage of the church in that region, which is that the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon were all divinely inspired and should be received as such. Pope St. Boniface I received the acts of these councils and affirmed them, and in fact sent out another letter confirming this to the Western Church. So we have Boniface ratifying what Pope St. Damasus had taught, 
and then the Patriarch of the West, Pope St. Damasus, speaking for the Western Church, uh, the bishops of the North African Church, speaking for the North African Church, all coming together and achieving consensus that the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon were the sum total of divinely inspired literature in the Old Testament. And so I gave you a few other uh, examples. Pope Innocent uh, writing a letter to the bishops of Gaul, which is contemporary France, repeating this teaching. But really, after 397, the teaching is simply made reference to and repeated, and the issue is largely settled. We don't really have a major issue about the canonicity of the 46 books of the Old Testament until a thousand years later, when we begin to get to the time of the Reformers. So for over a millennium, you know that in 401, Jerome finished his homework from the Council of Rome. Uh, he finished his edition of the Vulgate, which became the standard Bible of Western Christendom, and the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon also present in the Vulgate. So there the matter sat, largely unmolested, for Christians in the West for over a thousand years. Now, one question will be, what happened such that the Protestants came to have only 39 books and adopted the Palestinian canon instead? So that's one question we'll return to in a second. But what did the Jews do in the meantime? Uh, another important movement in this development, we sort of zeroed in on the early church and focused on Episcopal teaching, standardizing the Alexandrian canon as the Bible for Christians. If we zero in now on the Jewish side of the history and look at what Jews were doing from the time of Christ forward, uh, we see a watershed event around 90 AD. Uh, and this is a Jewish rabbinical council uh, that took place at a place called Jamnia in classical language. It's called Yavne today. It's a coastal town outside of Jerusalem, and this happened in 90 AD. Now, just to set up a little bit of backdrop, 90 AD is not the happiest time for Jews in this region of the world. Yes, uh, you know that the Roman-Jewish wars escalate from 68 to 70. Jerusalem is under siege by the Romans. This ultimately culminates with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, including the sacking of the temple, the destruction of the second temple, not one stone left upon another, the, the political, economic, religious hub of Judaism is smashed. And you don't just do that to a people and walk away from it. Uh, that destruction of the temple kicks off a good, oh, what, 70 years of Jewish rebellion and guerrilla wars and attempts to uh, revenge the Roman desecration of the center of Judaism, leading all the way up. I think there was even a, a lecture in this uh, series about this, about the Bar Kokhba rebellion. We've, we've done that. Yeah, so all the way up to Simon Bar Kokhba in the 130s, uh, leading a tremendous uprising that was just like the other ones eventually crushed. Uh, the Romans were brutal in their occupation. It even became a capital crime to come within eyesight of Jerusalem for a Jew after all of these rebellions. And so in 90 AD, the rabbis that gathered at Jamnia to circle the wagons were facing a number of significant problems. Uh, one was the Roman-Jewish war and the uh, wholesale destruction of hundreds of thousands of Jews. Two was the loss of the temple, uh, which was the sacrificial center of Judaism, and not to mention the destruction of Jerusalem, which was a center of Jewish learning. Four, there was also the theological issue of what to do with the emerging sect of Jews that were now known as Christians. And so it's at Jamnia that we see a decision on the part of the rabbis gathered there to standardize for Judaism the issue of what books of the Old Testament are to be received as divinely inspired. And it's at Jemnia that the previous plurality, Jews being free to choose from the 46 or 39 book canon, uh, really begins to go away. A number of definitive statements issued that only the Bible in Hebrew, according to the 39 book canon in Palestine, should be the Bible read and used by Jews. Does that make sense? So at Jamnia, uh, we see a certain Jewish rejection of the Alexandrian canon and the tradition of reading the Bible in Greek. Now, just as you know about your desire to read Latin, Jews will begin shortly after making new translations of the Hebrew Bible into Greek uh, because people really do like to read their Bible in the vernacular. But from thereafter, the 39-book Palestinian canon becomes the standard canon amongst Jews used even to this day.
Now, a couple of quick points that I wanted to bring into this before we take a break, because I don't want to keep it going for too long. Jamnia is significant for a couple of reasons. One, it, it really begins to mark the emergence of Pharisaism as the dominant expression of Judaism. There were a number of, you probably know from reading the Gospel, a number of different Jewish denominations. You had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees, right? Uh, some mention, maybe some of you know of the Zealots or the Essenes. Uh, but there were different manners of observing Judaism, and Jamnia in some ways uh, represents the triumph of Pharisaical theological opinion and ever after in synagogue Judaism that emerges after Jamnia, you see this kind of distinctive theological impression. Now, some questions one might ask oneself. Uh, if you were a rabbi at Jamnia, besides just holding up the standard that was common in your region of the world, are there theological motivations that might lead those folks to reject the deuterocanonical books, the seven disputed books between the canons, books like Judith, Tobit, Baruch, Wisdom of Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, First and Second Maccabees. Now, it's an open question. We get some documents that we still have today, usually from the Mishnah or the Talmud, about the debates that happened at Jamnia, but we don't have nearly as much information as we would like about this important watershed event. Nonetheless, some scholars have a few hypotheses of what might be theological motivations leading the Jewish rabbis to abandon the, the Alexandrian texts in favor of the more conservative 39-book Palestinian canon. And I'll maybe summarize these in two points. One, uh, some of this late wisdom literature might be perceived as what I'll call a bridge to the Gospels. It's kind of fascinating. If we had time to read this wisdom literature, there are some things that emerge in the late wisdom literature that really express more distinctly than in the law or the prophets theological concepts that you're familiar with from Christian revelation. So, for example, there's a nice passage in Proverbs 8 about God's wisdom and how God's wisdom was there with God from before the foundation of the world. And part of what the wisdom literature does is to like to speculate on what is involved in some of these concepts that are underlying Judaism. In Genesis, you've got God, God's word, and God's spirit, right? Already in Genesis 1, the first three verses, there was God and the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and then God speaks, and things come to be. And so part of what the wisdom literature does is to meditate on this reality and say, what is this thing called God's wisdom? What is this thing called God's word? It was around, apparently, before creation. It's constantly coming and inspiring the prophets. It is moving theologically driven salvation history. God's word is making Israel fulfill the destiny that it was called to do. God's word is constantly enlightening men like David and Isaiah. What is it? And you begin to see in books like Proverbs a statement about how divine wisdom was there before the creation of the world. But you don't get nearly so much as you would find in, say, a book like the Wisdom of Solomon. Where if you look at Wisdom of Solomon 7.22, you begin to get this beautiful statement about divine wisdom that makes it, if we're going to jump the gun a little bit, like an eternal other in God. You might call it, maybe in light of much later Christian terminology, a second person in God. Now, person's not a biblical term. But take a look at Wisdom of Solomon 7.22. For wisdom the fashioner of all things taught me, for in her there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety. So these are all qualities of the undisturbable unity of God. And then maybe some more qualities you're more familiar with. All-powerful, overseeing all, all-knowing, right, governing the whole universe penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and subtle. For wisdom is more mobile than any motion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. For she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of the eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness." Though she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. 
And in every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. So you get this image of divine wisdom, all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere, a spotless reflection of God, a pure image. These are powerful statements that you have God and the wisdom of God, and one looks just like the other, identical in all ways. All the divine attributes you might attribute to the one God, you also attribute to his wisdom. Polytheism, not a chance. (laughs) Not in the nation of Israel, right? But nonetheless, a provocative statement that God's wisdom might somehow be together with God, one with God, not exactly the same as God, and through it all things were made. When you see uh, these statements, they are close, are they not, to the first chapter of John's Gospel? Where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through it everything was made? If you are an Alexandrian, and this is part of your Hebrew scriptures, when you hear Christian revelation about the Father and the Son and the Spirit, this might be a lot more plausible to you than if you did not have the late wisdom literature. A similar point might be made if you were looking at the Jewish revelation of the states of the afterlife. The Pentateuch says precious little. Some provocative things. Enoch is taken up straight into heaven. Where'd he go? What's he doing? Um, We know Elijah is taken up in the fiery chariot, right? And that's told to us in Kings. Isaiah makes some statements about how God someday will wipe every tear away from the face of God's holy ones. There's a nice apocalyptic tradition that talks about the end of the world and God's judgment of the wicked and of the just. But things in terms of what happens to the soul after death are still somewhat ambiguous. Sheol is usually where the souls go, and that's kind of a gloomy underworld place of really uncertain character. And there's not a lot of definition given to the fate of the just versus the fate of the wicked. But if you look again at the same book, since we're in the Wisdom of Solomon, and you look at Wisdom of Solomon 3, you begin to see in the wisdom literature a rather crisp discussion of the beatitude of the just forever in the bosom of Abraham and a fiery afterlife of judgment for the wicked. Wisdom of Solomon 3, one. some of you know this because it's on the back of funeral cards, very often cited there. But the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, and their going from us to be to their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them. Like sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth, and they will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones. But the ungodly will be punished, as their reasoning deserves, who disregarded the righteous man and rebelled against the Lord. And then that goes on for a little bit more about the temporal punishments of the ungodly. And ultimately, the end of the unrighteous generation is grievous at the end of chapter 3. We have this image, then, of the souls of the righteous in the hands of God forever. And indeed, you know the doctrine of the last things, that the righteous participate in the judgment of the wicked. You know that, as as a point of general eschatology? That part of what the righteous do, those are on the Lord's right hand, is they affirm God's judgment upon the wicked when the sheep are separated from the goats. Similar point being made here in the wisdom of Solomon. When the world is tried... And God's judgment comes upon the world, and it's the fiery days of Judgment Day. Uh, They will run like sparks through the stubble. They will be like glowing divine embers that burn away the things that are drossy and impermanent and not going to endure. And then, of course, you know the other part of the late literature that's 2 Maccabees, which talks about Judas Maccabeus making atonement for the souls of his fallen comrades in arms. (laughs) 
If you're in heaven, you don't need any prayer. If you're in hell, no prayer can help you. Catholics have often seized upon uh, Maccabees as a proof text for this third state of purgatory. You're familiar with that? Yeah, hopefully. So if you have this late wisdom literature, very provocative. Because the Lord comes right on the scene in the Gospels. The first words of John the Baptist and Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The wheat he will gather into his barn and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And the Gospel teaching on heaven, hell, and the afterlife is a lot closer to what we find in the late wisdom literature than anything earlier to that where the teaching is much more vague. So that's what I mean by a bridge to the New Testament that might be part of the theological motivation if the concern is what to do with this rising heresy called Christianity that might have led some of the more conservative minds at Jamnia, some of the representatives of Palestinian pharisaical thought to say, no, no, we've endured this stuff for far too long. This stuff has to go. How curious it is then that Martin Luther, who has his own bones to pick with certain Catholic doctrines, will go back to this canon 1,500 years later. So we'll leave it sit there, and then we'll have a short break, and uh, we can talk about the Protestant part of the story. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Just give me one second. If some of you had a hard time finding wisdom, we are going to spend the next year together studying Scripture. So if it felt like you were getting up, it was a little rusty, it's okay. We're going to start stretching those bones and exercising together. That's why we're together next Thursday for Day Verbum. Bring your Bibles. And then we're going to do a six-part series on salvation history together. So, okay, stand up and stretch and get some wine for yourselves or a cup of coffee. We got a lot of What's ground to cover. We got to talk story? about the Protestant Revolution. We got to talk about the Bible that you have in your hand and where it came from and the King James and the Douay Reims and the Ignatius Revised Standard Version and the New American and the St. Joseph and we got a lot of ground to cover. We're doing it all right now in the next 45 minutes. We're going from Martin Luther to to here. <laughs> Professor Janoslawski, sorry to put you in the same sentence as Martin Luther. That's okay. The arch heretic. That's okay. We're way over time. So we're going to get started right now. He's going to go fast. Okay. Uh, welcome back. We'll go speedily. Yeah, someone reminded me, second point that might have been a concern to the people that were uh, theologically motivated at Jamnia would be responding to Hellenism. Uh, because some of this stuff, one of the neat things about the wisdom of Solomon is you get actually a... Uh, sort of a, a critique and a refutation of something like Epicureanism and Stoic theories about the soul dissolving into nothing after death. Uh, but of course that's taking up again Greek philosophy and that would not be something that a sort of a more theologically conservative Jew would ever desire to do because who reads that stuff anyway? So uh, two basic points there then. The wisdom literature may be theologically objectionable to some of the pharisaical authorities at Jamnia because of its closeness to concepts that are found in the Christian message, and then two, because of the concerns about the Hellenism that are present in those books. So, is that okay for a, a quick overview of where we're going? Now, this is part of the thing, is that now maybe you can begin to see that although it seems like we're the crazy ones running around with seven extra books in our Bible, wasn't so. In the earliest times of the church, there was a plurality of usage amongst Jews and amongst Christians, whether they were Jewish Christian or Gentile Christian. At Jamnia, we see a marked departure from the Alexandrian canon in favor of just the Hebrew text and then uh, certainly just the Palestinian canon, although Jews began to make translations of that uh, Hebrew text tradition into Greek uh, just a couple centuries later because people wanted to read their scripture in the vernacular. So, as we did the Christian side of the story, there was really not a lot of controversy about the books of the Old Testament in the church from the 5th century up until we get to the time of the 15th and the Protestant Reformation. Uh, some other important moments in terms of the Western controversy about the canon. Surprisingly enough, this comes up before the Reformation. Uh, the Council of Florence had as its business trying to reconcile the division of East and West that happened during the Great Schism. And part of that business then entailed a number of documents. They had decrees to various parties that were separated churches. And in their decree to the Jacobites, who were a group of Christians following a certain patriarch named Jacob in and around Egypt, 
uh, there was a statement about the Old Testament canon that is to be received, in part because some of the Eastern churches that were uh, Orthodox or separated were holding a somewhat larger Old Testament canon. They might have a third or a fourth Maccabees, or sometimes a third or a fourth Ezra. And so they wanted to have a statement about the books that were to be considered divinely inspired. They repeated the 46-book canon of Alexandria, but they didn't find it sufficient grounds to like issue a canon and anathematize parties. But interestingly, Florence repeats this teaching, which has been uh, around in the church from the time of the 5th century. Now, as you all know, with Martin Luther, things begin to change, yes? Just to do it as quickly as we possibly can, there are a few different theological motivations that Martin Luther had in wanting to, as he might put it, return to the 39-book Palestinian canon. He was aware, of course, that the earliest church had no fixed usage, uh, and he was also aware that some of this stuff was worked out only in the 3rd and 4th century of the church, and indeed by people like Pope Innocent I and Pope St. Damasus. And so uh, there was a number of things that might be objectionable in the mind of Martin Luther for how you came to have the canon that Catholics had held. And there was a second layer of problem is that the Vulgate is the Bible of medieval Christendom was not only widely distributed, but also typically came to you in a nice crisp package larded with Catholic footnotes all about it. Uh, so there's a number of issues that are jarring to Martin Luther. One might be the theology of some of the books of the Old Testament. You know that Martin Luther was not a fan of books that contained statements that he did not like. So the famous, uh, the famous statement that everybody knows is since the Epistle of St. James contains the statement that faith without works is dead, he called it an epistle of straw and thought it contained rather paltry doctrine. Uh, some lesser well-known quotes about the book of Revelation. He said a revelation should reveal something. <laughs> he found it too enigmatic and did not therefore understand its place in the New Testament canon. But there was not the same kind of plurality to capitalize on. As we'll see in a moment, people would widely receive the epistle to St. James. And so while Luther might wanted to have gotten rid of the epistle of St. James, there it stayed. There was no rejection of the 27 books of the New Testament by Protestants, but... That deuterocanonical literature, those seven disputed books, uh, Luther took aim at, in part because, as we just mentioned, in Maccabees you have what? You have a statement about purgatory, and that flies in the face of his understanding of justification by faith alone, and he also did not like the notion of people interceding ultimately on behalf of the spiritual progress of other people. And then there's a whole issue of different stations of the just. Luther didn't like the idea of people having higher and lower positions in heaven. And so uh, Maccabees is theologically objectionable to Luther, and therefore he decided that it would be best for Christians to return to the practice of the so-called early church and embrace the 39-book canon uh, that was used by the Jews, because, hey, it's the Jewish canon, and isn't that original, and isn't this the literature of the Jewish people? And he was aware that even in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century of the church, there were individual fathers uh, that expressed their preference for the Palestinian canon. Interestingly enough, he loved to cite Jerome. Jerome, you know, was writing in Bethlehem and was deeply embedded in the Hebrew literature of the time. And when Jerome was asked his opinion at the Synod of Rome, he favored the 39-book Palestinian canon. But when the Synod asked him to produce the Vulgate, and the Synod had decided that the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon were to be the books received by Christians, did Jerome protest and say, No, Mr. Pope, I'm sorry, I have to follow my own earnest theological conviction. It's only the 39? Uh, no. <laughs> you cannot find in Jerome a proto-Luther. Uh, Jerome produced an edition of the Vulgate with the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon because the Synod of Rome had decided that that was what it wanted to have as the books for the Western Church. And so Luther tried to capitalize on early church dispute and say, well, if we're going to go back to the observance of the early church and free ourselves from popery, we should have the 39-book Palestinian canon of the Jews that conveniently sweeps certain theological proof texts under the rug. The other interesting thing uh, that ties back to the Hellenism bit is, of course, Martin Luther thought that philosophy was ultimately the stinking puddle of men's traditions and nothing but a perversion because human reason is so deeply fallen that it cannot, on its own, do anything constructive in the pursuit of God. And so when you see some of this wisdom literature 
trying to incorporate Hellenistic thought. This was precisely the kind of thing Luther was trying to purge from theology. He would have it that theology was about revelation alone and the incorporation of Plato and Aristotle, uh, Aristotelian concepts, things that had come from Greek thought and became the mainstay of scholastic thought. All of that Luther would like to have gotten rid of from theology. And so another reason perhaps why these books struck him as uh, onerous and therefore he led a number of reformers to abandon the previous millennium of usage of the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon in favor of a return to the supposedly original 39 books of the Palestinian canon. But of course, as you know, uh, you cannot make that kind of claim to originality. Uh, it's demonstrable if anyone does historical research, as I've been trying to sketch for you tonight, uh, that the Christian church had widely used this even before the conciliar definitions of the 4th century, and it was certainly nothing that was widely used by Christians all throughout Christendom, uh, either before or after when the 46 books of the Alexandrian canon were the Bible of medieval Christendom. Uh, so for a thousand years, no controversy, and before that, wide embrace of the Septuagint. Uh, so you cannot actually claim to be historically original by going back to the 39 book canon. Uh, it is simply not historically true that this was the Bible of the earliest church because it was most Jewish. Does that make sense? Yes. So in response to that, Trent anathematizes uh, those that would reject the Alexandrian canon and gives its now very familiar 46 book list that had been repeated from over a thousand years ago. Now here's the curious thing, is that sometimes when you meet Protestants and they talk to you about the extra books in your Bible, you'll find the assertion that Trent added seven books to the Bible. And if you know the history, you can see that that is simply historically not true. While Trent gives us our first ecumenical council level statement, our first infallible statement about the canon of sacred scripture, in listing the 46 books, Trent repeated the teaching of Florence a hundred years earlier, and then Florence itself was repeating the teaching that had been echoed for over a thousand years, all the way back to 382. And when Pope St. Damasus was doing this, even in the Synod of Rome, he was reflecting already the usage of Christian churches even before that time. Uh, so it's manifestly untrue that the Catholic Church added seven books to sacred scripture during the time of the Reformation. And it's manifestly untrue that Trent is doing something novel by asserting that these books belong to the Old Testament. The other thing that is, of course, interesting when you deal with Protestants is that when you want to be sola scriptura, to return to my original point, you have to have a scriptura. And to have a scriptura, you have to have some table of contents. There was a welter of Jewish literature that nobody received as divinely inspired sacred scripture of comparable antiquity, of religious character, but neither the Palestinian authorities nor the Alexandrian authorities deemed them divinely inspired sacred scripture. Ultimately, if you're going to have a scriptura, you need to have an authority that tells you what is in that scriptura. And historically, the only thing that explains why we have the 46 books that we have today is the magisterium of the church and not simply the teaching of the apostles. The Lutherans might be willing to say, well, I believe in the teaching authority of the apostles. They were the ones commissioned by Jesus. They could speak in Christ's name, but uh, they don't want to get into apostolic succession and the idea of bishops who were the successors of the apostles somehow exercising comparable authority. But when you look at why we have the Bible that we do, and we'll echo this point in a minute when we talk about the New Testament, it is because of the teaching authority of the bishops of the church not during the time of Christ, or a century afterwards, or two centuries afterwards, but all the way up until the fifth century of the church. You have to believe in not only the teaching authority of the apostles, but also their successors, and not for a little while, for a relatively long time. Protestants usually tell some kind of corruption story if they believe in apostolic authority at all. Jesus commissioned the apostles. Their authority was true and unsullied and was given to them by God. Now, they might either doubt that it gets passed down to anyone after the original 12, or sometimes you'll get a story about how the church eventually succumbs to forces of worldliness. Pick your corruption point. Sometimes it's with the Edict of Constantine when the church becomes tolerated and part of the religion of the empire. 
Uh, maybe it's with the coming in of lots of uh, Greek philosophy infecting theology and turning it into the speculations of men. Uh, whether it's in the 3rd century or whether it's in the 6th century, either way, they usually give you some story of magisterium going off the rails or no longer being functional. But it's interesting, if Scripture is where everything gets started from, and the only reason we have the canon of Scripture that we have today is because of the teaching authority of bishops in the 4th and 5th century, to ask them, well, if it was functioning then, why isn't it functioning now? Because clearly it functioned not just with the apostles, but with their successors, and for a long time, if we believe in the canon of Scripture that we believe in today. We'll see that even more clearly with the New Testament. So let's turn to that, uh, because you might say, well, why? If we're behind on time, maybe we'll save some time. Protestants and Catholics share the same 27-book New Testament, yes? We agree on the contents. But part of the interesting thing that comes from studying this is, again, the role of the bishops in forming the New Testament, and also something that comes up every now and again. The Da Vinci Code now, the star has risen and set, but there are sensational exposés about the Jesus that the church doesn't want you to know about that occasionally come to light. You get these, you know, uh, ancient texts discovered, and surprise, surprise, an alternative portrait of Jesus that you haven't heard about, but comes from a document of great antiquity, You've sometimes seen these uh, sort of salacious statements about the new Christ that we've discovered through looking at ancient manuscripts. Part of what studying the formation of the New Testament canon allows you to do is to understand where some of these uh, statements are coming from about what's found in what's called the Apocrypha, which is, again, a term for non-canonical, non-divinely inspired early church literature. Maybe some of you know, uh, just to do the basic timeline, What's the earliest parts of the New Testament that we have? We've got the Revelation, the tail end of it, written maybe around the cusp of the second century, 90 AD, maybe a little bit further on. Earliest parts of the New Testament, some of Paul's letters, yep, go all the way back to like 52, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And so you can, depending on your dating of the Gospel of Matthew, some people put it as early as 36. It's a very like, early traditional date. Some people put it a little bit later. But you've got the formation of the New Testament writings that start really in the 30s or 40s and roll on till the end of the first century. Yes? Can't have a New Testament unless it's all been written down first. So no, no New Testament as a unit to speak of in the first century at all because the ink's not even wet on St. John's writing until the end. You know? then all of that writing has to be disseminated, yes? The early church is exploding like a supernova throughout Asia Minor and Southern Europe, and uh, you know, all of this is occasional literature. The Gospels are written to particular communities. We know that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark for the Christians in Alexandria and in Rome because Mark was the scribe of Peter and set down Peter's way of preaching about Jesus Christ. You know, we know the circumstances that led to the writing of Paul's letters. They're all occasional. He's dashing off epistles as he's going from place to place, and he's supporting and teaching and correcting and building up the churches that he's also founded elsewhere and has now traveled from. Yes, Paul's letters are all, it's just his mail, divinely inspired mail. There's probably a dozen other 30, 40, 50, 100, who knows, tons of Pauline mail, but only some of it's divinely inspired sacred scripture. In fact, we know Paul wrote other letters that are not divinely inspired. You know that? He mentions them. He talks about an epistle to the Laodiceans, because he says to the Colossians, hey, after you're done reading this, send it over to Laodicea and have them read it, and you read the thing I wrote to Laodiceans. Switch. 1 Corinthians talks about an earlier letter, and there might have been yet another letter between the canonical 1 and 2 Corinthians. Let's call it a 1.5 Corinthians. Uh, and then it's very probable that, so Paul even refers to other letters that he wrote, and then, of course, the, some of the apostles were quite literate men. They might have written all kinds of things, Yes. So there's the production of all the canonical works of the New Testament that we recognize today, together with other writings of the apostles, and then other writings of Christians from the first and second century. And so one of the things that's important not to forget is that the New Testament emerged out of a welter of early Christian writing about Jesus and about Christianity. Uh, one of the things, just because I didn't want to bury you alive in, in handouts, is I, I had this little... Uh, two-page list, which was a subset of all the known early Christian writings from like the second and third century. By the time we get into the second and third century, there were well over a dozen accounts called Gospels. 
a couple dozen epistles. Apocalypses were a booming cottage industry. Uh, there was at least ten apocalypses written, and uh, there was a whole variety of Christian literature that was being produced. And on top of that, some of it was uh, forged or purporting to be in the name of an apostolic figure. And then there were gospels being produced to support the theological agenda of people like Gnostic heretics or people that were denying the incarnation of Jesus in the flesh and people that were sometimes altering other existing copies of the gospel. Early church sects like the Ebionites who tended to deny the divinity of Christ and say that he was the human son of Joseph and Mary and was simply the most enlightened expositor of the law of Moses took Matthew's gospel, hacked off the front, hacked off the passion account and said, this is why he's king in Israel, because he interprets the law of Moses according to its spirit in a way that no other scribe or Pharisee had done. And thus was born something that some people call the gospel to the Hebrews. So there's all of the 27 books of the New Testament, but they are a minority in terms of early Christian writing. There are all these other letters, apocalypses, gospels, and then on top of that there are forgeries, mutilations of existing canonical documents, things claiming to be written in the name of Peter or Paul or John. And the question is, how does all of this stuff get sorted out? So in the other handout, I provided you important moments in the history of the New Testament canon. The first wave of gathering and weeding out happens through informal cooperation, bishop to bishop in the early church. First, you want to get all the good stuff. Right? Uh, so certain seas that were very well positioned, like at Corinth, where it's sort of a trade hub for the uh, Greek world, or certain seas of particular importance or antiquity, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, you know, those are the other patriarchal seas. Yes, Rome, you know, the early patriarchal seas, were oftentimes gathering points for Christian literature. And then, not only were they gathering points, oh, we've got three of Paul's letters, how many do you have? Well, we've got five, which ones do you have? Okay, well, let's figure out, we'll make copies, and that way we'll all have a fuller set. Not only were they gathering up as preciously as they could do, because remember, all this was hand-copied, right? I hope this doesn't need uh, repeating, is that there was no kinkos, no staples, uh, no automatic download. The ancients would have dropped dead at the rapidity with which we can copy texts. All this had to be hand copied, right? So you want, to, you want a copy of Paul's letters? First, kill an animal or get some papyrus because um, you're going to write it on leather or you're going to write it on paper. And then all this has to be hand copied, and that's a time consuming, labor intensive, sometimes rather expensive proposition. So all this stuff has to be disseminated first. And bishops prized apostolic writing and would go to lengths to collect the writings of the apostles and to possess them as much as they could. But also, part of this Episcopal activity is also weeding out the chaff from the wheat. And so if you want some early examples of how this happens, it's interesting. It's the liturgy that becomes the seedbed for the New Testament. Justin Martyr, I don't know if you're familiar with that, early church father, wrote a couple of apologies, not, uh, I'm sorry, but defenses of Christianity, uh, one to the emperor, one to the Senate of Rome. And he recounts, the, uh, gives us an early extra-biblical account of Christian liturgy. And in part of his description of early Christian liturgy, he says what goes on. And in the Liturgy of the Word, he says, first they read, basically from the Old Testament, and then from the Law and the Prophets, and then they read from what he calls the Memoirs of the Apostles. He says, on Sunday, the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets would be read as long as time permits. And when the reader is finished, the man presiding urges and invites us in a sermon to imitate the noble things described therein. That's First Apology 66. So already in the Sunday liturgy, we see the desire to read the writings of the apostles. And how, together with what was already going on in synagogue liturgy, which was reading of the Torah, followed up by a reading from the prophets. And so part of what's going on there is now there emerges this question, what is suitable to be read at Mass? And that is basically code for what is divinely inspired. Why? Because you're reading it along with the Law and the Prophets. You're reading it along with the divinely inspired texts of the Old Testament. And so some of the earliest texts we have about bishops sorting out the wheat from the chaff 
come to us in the form of bishops asking other bishops what they believe is suitable to be read at Mass. It's amazing what you can dig out of the ground. An Italian archaeologist named Muratori uh, dug up what is now called the Muratorian Fragment, dates to about 170 AD, and it's an example of this. It's the Bishop of Rome writing to another bishop about what books he receives, that is to say permits, and what books he possesses, and what books are outrightly garbage. So there's a threefold sort in this letter. It's called a canonical list. When bishops couldn't exchange texts, they exchanged letters expressing their opinions about texts. Here's all the texts I know of. These we read at Mass. These are interesting, noteworthy, laudable, perhaps useful, but are not read at Mass. And then these are outright garbage. Please give them to the circular file before your flock gets corroded by them. Does that make sense? Sort of a basic threefold sorting strategy. One bishop writing to another saying, here's all the apostolic stuff that we've got and that we read, equals divinely inspired. Here's the other stuff that's laudable, but we're not using it in the sacred liturgy because we don't consider it of that rank. And then here are things that are positively noxious. Please protect the faithful. Don't even copy them or circulate them. They're bad. Uh, you can read the Muratorian fragment. It's online. And it goes through and reviews all of the books that the bishop knows about and his opinions about each one. And so the first rudimentary notion that we have of a canon emerges from this informal Episcopal cooperation. Bishop writing to bishop, sharing copies of the writings of the apostles, and also opining about other literature they know about, whether it's good or bad. Does that make sense? Now, that kind of informal cooperation is nice for the first couple of centuries of Christianity, but when things begin to get difficult, an explosion of Christian literature, together with the rise of major heresies, people doubting the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, people asserting the Trinity is three gods, or people denying that the Son and the Spirit are really separate persons, or like three persons in the one God, and collapsing it into a unipersonal God. Major struggles of basics of Christian doctrine happening in the 3rd and 4th century, the kind of things that occasioned the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. Together with this comes a desire for Christians to get on one page about what is to be considered the canon of the New Testament. These things always go hand in hand. Right? Theological controversy and the desire to know what's the authoritative written word of God. Yes, canon emerges together with the basic orthodoxy about Trinity and Christology, because if you have some goofy gospel, then somebody's going to use that as a proof text for their goofy theological position. Does that make sense? So they want to weed out the spurious texts, the heretical texts that are being used to support some of these early heresies. So when people desire to get some sense of what is the practice of the church, we see two important figures uh, start to study this before we get any conciliar activity. Origin of Alexandria is one of them. Quite likely the foremost scripture scholar of his day. He was a priest of the Diocese of Alexandria. He's working in the early third century. And he harnessed the enormous power that he had as someone in Alexandria, hub of literacy for the known world, to gather as much information he could about every piece of extant early Christian writing, where it came from, whether it was authentic, and most importantly, his ecclesiastical connections to figure out the mind of the episcopacy about this particular book. So he began to survey bishops and to see what they thought about uh, particular books that he knew about. And he divided the opinion of bishops into three categories. So for a given book, it was either a book that was received by everybody, that was received by only some, i.e. disputed, some liked it, some didn't, for use at Mass, or rejected by everyone as not divinely inspired, not suitable for use at Mass. Does that make sense? Basic threefold sort. Received by all, disputed, received by no one. And if you take a look at the uh, important moments of the New Testament canon handout I provide for you, you can see the results of Origen's work. In the category of received by all, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts of the Apostles, 13 out of the 14 Pauline letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, and the Apocalypse of St. John, also called the Book of Revelation. And then in the disputed category, received by some, we have the rest of the canonical New Testament down to where it's shaded into gray. So Epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, that's your 14th Pauline letter, 
2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, James, and Jude. So if you stopped right there, you'd have the entirety of the 27 books of the New Testament. But also in that disputed category, Epistle of Barnabas, a work of the early church called the Didache, or the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, like your earliest catechism. It's a summary of apostolic teaching. The Shepherd of Hermas, an early Christian moral work. And then a Gospel to the Hebrews, which, as we said a moment ago, was probably an altered copy of Matthew's Gospel in use by some. And so you can see there, already in the early third century, the mind of the episcopacy zeroing in on the sum total of the New Testament. Never is there affirmed by all bishops a book that is not part of the New Testament. So in that received by all category is only canonical books. And then the rest of them are in that received by some, together with some other works of laudable character. We're reading in my uh, early church father's class, we read the Didache and the Pastor of Hermas. It's got some wonderful moral counsels that are still as useful today as they were 1,800 years ago. And so some of this work is laudable and of good character, but is not divinely inspired sacred scripture. Now Eusebius, working about a century later, decides to make the sieve a little bit tighter and does the same kind of thing, surveys the mind of the episcopacy about the books that it receives as divinely inspired in the New Testament. And the results of his study you can see on the back. He made the sieve a little bit tighter by dividing books into those received by all, those received by most, and those received by few. No need to revisit the dud category of received by no one. And if you look at this survey of Eusebius, of the bishops of the world at the time he was able to communicate with, we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, all 14 Pauline letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, the Apocalypse of John. Then in the second category, received by most, the rest of the New Testament. James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John. And only. So in the first two categories, the New Testament and nothing but the New Testament. Then the hangers-on, received by a few bishops, Barnabas, Didache, Shepherd of Hermas, etc. And so you can see there already by the beginning of the 4th century, the consensus of the episcopacy. If they had a council at that moment and called up everybody on the phone and said, what do you think about what should be the New Testament, and they had a vote, it would be only those canonical books of the New Testament that we have today. Does that make sense? So these are the antecedents on the New Testament side of what happens then at the Synod of Rome and the Synods of Carthage and the things that we mentioned in connection with the formation of the Old Testament. When they were hammering out the Old Testament, reference what we just said an hour ago, but when they were deciding on the New Testament, they made use of this culling of the tradition of the church to see what bishops receive these texts as fit to be read alongside the Torah and the prophets. And it's from this kind of consensus of the episcopacy uh, that emerges the teaching of the Synod of Rome about the New Testament, the Synods of Hippo and Carthage about the New Testament the writing of St. Athanasius about the New Testament in 367. And so by the middle of the 4th century into the 5th, we see uniformity of opinion about what constitutes the New Testament. And uh, there the matter stays, thankfully unmolested, even after the time of the Reformation. But the important point is, do you see how this emerges from the mind of the Episcopacy? This is something that only comes through the gathering of Episcopal consensus and the teaching of bishops expressed in councils. So even with the New Testament, there is not some fully fledged book that drops from heaven as the canonical writings. Jesus could have said, guys, write this down, right? It's one of the mysteries of God's providence. Jesus could have left us writings in his own hand. He did not. Jesus could have said, now before I ascend to heaven, since you're all here, please write the text you will use to evangelize the nations, because I'm sending you. But he did not. Rather, he willed that his written word was conveyed to men through the individual writings of people and then consolidated through divinely appointed spokesmen, the successors to the apostles. Jesus could have said on earth to take every controversy into hand in his immortal glorified body, one wonders what descent might have looked like if that was the case. But he did not. He ascended into heaven and left behind us a living magisterium to speak in his name. 
And it's through that mechanism that we have the canon of the New Testament that we possess today. So it's tradition and it's magisterium, always together with scripture, whether it's the old or the new. Is that good? Okay, uh, so that was a quick history. I know that was a lot, right? And that wasn't even the whole of it. So part of what I want to conclude with tonight, oh boy, is some discussion about the text that we have of sacred scripture. Because beyond the canon, which is vitally important, because you can't even begin to talk about what scripture says if you don't know where to put your finger on it, scholars have exerted a great amount of effort into the recovery of the best text possible, the inspired word of God. Now, copying has been going on forever, right? Think about this. The Pentateuch, 13th century, even the late wisdom literature happening a few centuries before the time of Christ. We possess nothing like a autograph copy from the pen of the original inspired writer, no matter who he was, not even St. John. Instead, what we have are text traditions that come down to us in several different forms. You can cheat by looking at the handout, but does anyone know? We talked about the Vulgate, which is, of course, a translation and the production of St. Jerome. We talked about the Septuagint, which contains the Greek text of the Old Testament, and then that later gets fattened up with the Greek of the New Testament. And then we have the Hebrew text tradition, three distinct languages, three text traditions. We good? Now, when we want to recover those, here's the fascinating thing. Now, each of your English Bibles is based on some underlying original text that it's rendering, yes? In terms of where we get our Old Testaments from today. If we work backwards, it's a little simpler. Uh, those of you that read the Douay Rem, does anyone read the Douay Bible here? Yeah, so where is that from? You know, how, how the, what, what does the Douay use as its base text? Straight from the Vulgate, right. So there we have an English translation directly from the Vulgate. What about something like the RSV or the NAB or the Jerusalem Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Bible, or the Jerusalem Bible? Does anyone know where those things come from? <laughs> Hebrew, Greek, something in there, right? <laughs> so here's the question. We have two basic trains of thought we have to... Uh, sort of follow out here. One is, scholars constantly working to get us the best, most ancient texts of scripture possible. And then, a second issue, which is, when we have disparity between, say, what the Septuagint reads and what the Hebrew Masoretic text tradition reads, which one's right? And it's those two issues that are uh, driving what underlies the differences in English translation in your Bibles today. So here's something fascinating. When we look at our oldest physical copies of the Vulgate, okay, Jerome produced it in 401. What's in terms of stuff we have and we can look at today, what's our oldest copy of the Vulgate? I gave you the cheat sheet on the back of, if you go back to the original structure, my, my outline for the whole talk, we've got complete Vulgates way, way back. What's our earliest, like, exemplar of the Vulgate text tradition. Anyone find it there? See it on the back? I've even lost my own hand out here. There you go. So you've got, if you look on the, on the bottom where it says manuscript authorities for a present day Bible, point two and the forming of uh, sacred scripture. The Vulgate of St. Jerome. See it there, 401? We have physical copies produced in the 500s. That's 100 years, a little bit more, 150 years after the time it was written. That's astoundingly close in terms of biblical manuscript textual preservation. We've got other copies that are 7th, 8th century tons from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. So while the Vulgate is a translation, two things in its favor. One, it's a very well-preserved text. We have physical exemplars that are very close to when the original was made. Two, Jerome was a trilingual scholar in the time when all of those languages were fresh and spoken and had access to manuscripts that we do not have access to anymore. So while you have on the one side, the Vulgate is a translation, and so when you read the Douay, you're reading a translation of a translation, 
And if the Septuagint's translating the Hebrew, you're reading a translation of a translation of a translation. On the other hand, it's an incredibly well-preserved text, and it was performed by a scholar who had the competency of the ancient world in his favor and the esteem of a number of scholars of his day and a resource that we don't have anymore, which is all those texts circulating in the Holy Land during his day that are now lost to us. So that's one thing, that's the Vulgate. Septuagint, in terms of physical evidence for the Septuagint. What's our earliest complete copies of the Septuagint? We've had some incredible finds over the past 200 years. There are three basic manuscripts. Uh, one of them is available online called Codex Sinaiticus, so-called because it was discovered at the Monastery of St. Catharines at the base of Mount Sinai. Ancient manuscript, but ancient how old? Yeah, so written somewhere between 325 and 360 A.D., fourth century A.D. That is still six, seven hundred years after the production of the original Septuagint. That's a half a millennium for copying and recopying and passing down. We've got another uh, late 4th century, early 5th century text. Uh, we've got Codex Vaticanus and then Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus, 4th, uh, early 5th century. They're complete. You can view Sinaiticus online. It's beautiful. If you can read Greek, you can read it right off the page. Uh, so some of this stuff is incredibly well preserved, but we're dealing with a 600 year gap between the original text and what we have today in physical evidence. Third major text family, the Masoretic text. This is the Hebrew as preserved by Hebrew scribes in and around Palestine. A scribe is called a Masorite, and so it's called the Masoretic text. We have uh, a wonderful Hebrew text tradition. We have the oldest complete Hebrew Bible from when? 1008 AD. You'd think it would be a lot older, wouldn't you? So 11th century AD, rendering a textual tradition that goes back from before the Septuagint. That's our earliest complete Hebrew Old Testament. So it becomes interesting when you ask yourself the question, as a biblical scholar, what base text do I use for my translation? Do I use the Vulgate? Very well preserved, but a translation of a translation, but by St. Jerome. Do I use the Septuagint? Pretty well preserved, but not nearly as well preserved as the Vulgate, but it at least has this common origin and was disseminated widely and was the Bible used by the early Christian churches. Or do I use the Hebrew text tradition? The original, after all, because all that Old Testament stuff was written in Hebrew, except for a few books. I could go there, but do I have the original Hebrew text? When you look at the manuscript evidence for that Hebrew text, a rather big gap in time. Now there are earlier papyruses and fragmentary evidences for the Old Testament in Hebrew, but when you look at the oldest complete text, a rather substantial amount of time has passed. So part of what biblical committees do today when they make a new edition of the Bible is ask themselves first, what's my base text? And when they don't agree, which one do I go with? Does that make sense? And then the other issue, that comes up in committees is, of course, the issue of translation. Because uh, some people think, and this is the beauty of knowing a foreign language, and I know that it's not the common American thing to do, uh, but if you've ever played around with a foreign language, it is difficult to render things word for word from one source language to a target language in another language. There are issues like idiom. There are issues about the difficulty of one word not really matching up very well with one English word. Hebrew is a very terse language. It sometimes loads one word with a number of possible meanings. And so when you try to discern the best way to render this in English, you have to make judgment calls. And so there are really uh, a few factors going on. When you open up your NAB and set it next to your RSV, and you set that next to your Douay, uh, which is my poor man's way of figuring out whether your text in the Bible is difficult. <laughs> Whenever my students can't read any of the biblical languages, just open up several editions, lay them out together, and if they seem to be really different, that might be a sign you have a textual problem. <laughs> but when you look at the different editions of the scripture and you see that they diverge in terms of their contents, part of the reason might be translator's judgment call. Another part of the reason might be a different base text. And that provokes the question of which one is more authoritative. And in part, there's a theological consideration to be made there. So if you look at your RSV Catholic edition, what it's going to do 
It's going to take into consideration the Septuagint textual tradition and the Masoretic textual tradition and weigh them and also keep Jerome around on the margins, at least a little bit more in the Catholic edition than in the RSV non-Catholic edition. And so what they're trying to do there is to balance the best reading of a text. I'll give you one fun example because I know we're short on time. The fourth suffering servant prophecy in Isaiah. Uh, you know that beautiful prediction of Christ's passion 700 years before it happens, Isaiah 53. I'm going to cheat, Sabatino. I'm going to use my tabs. There's a wonderful verse, 52, 15. So this is the beginning of the prophecy. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. Dot, dot, dot. Now, a little footnote in your RSV. Mine says the meaning of the Hebrew word is uncertain. <laughs> if you look at the RSV, it says startle. If you look at the NAB, it says astound. If you look at a due, it says sprinkle. <laughs> what? So shall he sprinkle many nations. And the Vulgate says, Iste asperget gentes multas. Aspersion, you know, sprinkling. And you wonder what's going on there. When you look at the Hebrew underlying thing, the word, uh, I think it's naza, has this original base sense of to spurt out. And uh, when you're startled, sometimes you spurt out. Yes? Uh, it can have this sense of the kind of explosion of surprise. And when you're talking about the suffering servant being marred beyond all human semblance, and when you see him, people are going to say, whoa, you might naturally sort of take the connotation of startle and run with it. But Jerome, trilingual, into the theology of the Old Testament, chose sprinkle. And if you go and look at how this Hebrew word is used in the Pentateuch, it is always used in the manner of the sprinkling of blood or of water in a ritual offering. And so, all of a sudden, that textual choice seems to make sense. It's always used in terms of the sprinkling of blood or lustral water, because what's the suffering servant going to do? Tells you in the rest of the prophecy, by his death and by his bearing our transgressions, he will make many to be accounted righteous. And the text introduces, he'll be lifted up, just like a ritual offering. And so, through all of his suffering unto death, he will sprinkle many nations. I think Jerome there got it right and captured that dead on in the Vulgate reading, although it might seem to you initially as a little bit strange. So sometimes there's good reason for consulting the Vulgate as a theological insight into the meaning of the text. Jerome was aware of these live issues of how the Hebrew might be rendered well or poorly. Sometimes there's an important thing captured to us in the Septuagint that is lost perhaps in the Vulgate. And so you can dust off and deepen your Vulgate reading by getting back in contact with the original languages. But there's no like magic bullet, one size fits all, perfect translation in my mind. Uh, that's why it's been the call of the Vatican for the past 150 years for Catholic scholars to reinvest themselves in the original languages and to participate in the recovery of the most ancient copies of the text and to do the difficult business of comparing manuscript after manuscript. So maybe that's a good place to leave off. I didn't get to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which would be fascinating. I just went and saw them two weeks ago. But I think our tradition here is to do some questions and things of that nature. So is, much, that, is that a decent Thank place you very to much. stop? Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. And not to worry about the Dead Sea Scrolls because we're going to Qumran as a, as a group oh, next yeah. year. The Shrine so. of the Book in the Holy Land. If you want to see this stuff, that's where you have to go. We're going. Yeah. We're going. So, okay. Okay. Have a seat. We don't do question and answer with people standing up. <laughs> so make your commitment. You're either in or you're out. There's, I'll give you a hint. There's darkness outside and there's light in here. I would stay in here. Okay. Tell us about the Good News Bible. Where does it fall on all of this? The good, is this one of these contemporary English translations? Yes. Yeah, so uh, scholars debate what it means to accurately translate. 
Uh, sometimes you can have a very literal, trying to be word for word translation that nonetheless does not get the essential point across. Uh, so sometimes there have been more flexible, looser translations that are trying to capture the gist of the meaning without dragging you through what might sound to be like biblical verbiage. Yes, sometimes the Old Testament speaks in its own way. Uh, so there have been a number of, uh, there's a living Bible, there's a dynamic word Bible. There's a number of them that are trying to translate based on the idea of getting the sense across and not being a literal word for word translation. However, the problem is this. There's always substantial interpretation that goes on in doing that. Because the so-called translator, now really rewriter, is saying this is what the text really means and this is how I can express it more succinctly in today's words. I think it's a better approach to do a literal translation and provide commentary for when you have things that are difficult to render into the original language or using concepts that are ancient. So it can be a dangerous game. Good evening. I have uh, chapter 7, verse 23 of wisdom, the nature of wisdom, okay? She is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, and it goes on. It's very beautiful. Is this the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Blessed Trinity? Yeah, so the, uh, the wisdom of God, and especially in that text, it says she's a breath of the power of God, and breath and spirit... Uh, pneuma in Greek are the same word. Uh, the early church had to sort out a couple of issues. God the Father, and then we have in the Old Testament God's Word, God's Wisdom, and God's Spirit. <laughs> Those are three other terms. There's only two persons of the Trinity. And so you'll see various church fathers <clears throat> dividing up passages as to what applies to the Word and what applies to the Spirit. And I think you would find people on either side of that because it says breath of the power of God, though some wisdom stuff is typically lined up with the word, the second person of the Trinity. So I think you could read it either way, although you will find fathers reading this as, as the word and not the spirit. It says is a breath of the power of God. So perhaps it applies to the spirit. Um, thank you. What a beautiful presentation tonight. Incredible. My understanding was that, and, and I'm sorry I can't think of the teaching, but one of the teachings of Christ was taken almost as a quote from Sirach. So even if the apostle that wrote it were writing it in Hebrew, it would be taken from the Septuagint, uh, which if he did say that, if he did teach from that, Christ was using it. So, and also along the line of Sirach, this is a semicolon, so it's, it's, I'm getting to the question mark. Um, also, uh, uh, in my understanding also is that Luther, one of his reasons that he gave for taking out some of the Deuterocanonicals, like Sirach, was that there wasn't evidence that it was ancient enough, but then whenever they found a near complete manuscript in Qumran, it blew it out of the water because it showed it to be ancient. And, and something like Sirach 24, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of the entire Bible that gives the kerygma in one single chapter, the mission of Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ given to you, which would be a great reason that the pharisaical tradition would not want that included also. Yep. So, so <laughs> Is that a question mark, Susie? <laughs> Sir, we can do it in reverse order. Uh, Sirach 24, another great wisdom text. This is precisely the kind of like anticipations of the Trinity in the late wisdom literature thing that I'm talking about. Uh, with respect to what the New Testament indicates about the canon of the old, we have a couple of different issues. One, the New Testament quotes texts that are Old Testament texts of canonical status, and it also quotes texts that nobody thinks are in the canon. So, for example, the Jude quotes an apocalypse of Enoch. Uh, there are some other uh, Jewish writings that are in neither the 39 nor the 46 book canon that are quoted in the New Testament. So, while the new quoting the old is interesting, one cannot use it as a litmus test for what's canonical. In fact, you know, Paul even quotes pagan poets, right, uh, in his Areopagus speech. However, uh, the thing that I did find compelling was when you do look at where it's discernible, what edition they are using, it seems that I think everything except for certain Catholic epistles and the book of Revelation, if it quotes Old Testament, tends to favor the rendering as it's found in the Septuagint. Some people discard that simply because it's Greek to Greek. And just as even in the English-speaking tradition, you might be a Catholic, but when you quote the psalm, you go, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, 
He leadeth me through verdant pastures, and you just spit out the KJV because it's so prevalent in our English-speaking idiom. Uh, some people will take that as not sufficient evidence for really the status of the Septuagint in the mind of the New Testament authors. Because again, it's, if you're writing in Greek, you're going to quote it in Greek. And if you're quoting it in Greek, you're going to quote the Septuagint. But it proves that they knew it. Uh, and it also is, I think, still nonetheless worth asking if they were somehow purists and wanted to capture the Masoretic text and use that as a theologically authoritative basis. They were smart enough to render it into Greek in a way that wouldn't be the exact same way as the Septuagint says. And so I think it's compelling that a majority of the New Testament books tend to cite the Old Testament as it follows in the Septuagint translation where a difference is discernible. They could have dropped it into a fresh translation if they didn't like the Septuagint. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay. I'm happy to stay and talk afterwards. Yep. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.